Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. We go beyond the forecast to give you the how and why on all the cool and interesting things you've wondered about and wanted to ask in weather, space, and science. And today we're talking about the increasing frequency of extreme weather events, define what makes an extreme event, and show some examples, including an historic freeze, a major nor'easter blizzard, and also a catastrophic flooding event, just a few of the types of weather that can change places forever. And joining us now to discuss this as AccuWeather Chief Meteorologist Jonathan Porter. John, always good to have you uh, on the show. Good to be with you, Jeff, as always. Yeah, it's a good time uh, talking to you here. And uh, since you've been here at AccuWeather, since we both graduated in 2004, uh, your new role leading the forecasting operation is one that you settled into very well over the past few years. And it seems that uh, we are seeing more frequent extreme weather events. And uh, I suspect for most of us, you know, we don't get into the weather world because of partly sunny and 73. Hmm. Uh, how did you get into the weather and what led you to this current position uh, in the context of severe weather events? Well, Jeff, uh, that's right. I mean, uh, when you look at severe weather events, those are the most impactful to people. So many times they're dangerous. They can disrupt people's lives and their day to day plans. And from a global perspective, we see increasing impacts from severe weather events uh, driven by climate change and other factors as well. But what got me into meteorology was uh, my in interest. I grew up in Northeast Connecticut, and there we have a wide variety of different types of disruptive and severe weather, ranging from snowstorms to hurricane impacts at times, high wind events, uh, flooding rains, uh, severe thunderstorms, the list goes on and on. But for me, it was always the blizzards and the big snowstorms. That's what got me hooked on meteorology and really uh, it's what I wanted to do since I was four years old. And you and I are classmates from our time at, uh, at Penn State. And um, you know, that, that was uh, uh, always something here, helping to being on the, on the uh, uh, leading edge of innovation related to severe weather has been something that was always very important to me and uh, one of the reasons that I've been so excited about our work here at AccuWeather. Absolutely. Well, before we get into some specific examples, we wanted to kind of define what um, uh, the buzzword of extreme weather uh, means. Uh, we talk about that phrase sometimes, people uh, float it around. So what makes a, a weather event truly extreme? Well, I think there's a couple of factors to look at there. One is when you're dealing with a weather event where there's a risk to people and uh, to people's life safety, uh, to, their, uh, to their everyday activities, uh, may disrupt their travel plans, they may have to work around uh, changes to their schedule uh, around it, uh, and also things that are, are not uh, typical events that are occurring in various parts of the world. So uh, when you see these flooding rainfall events or um, a disastrous blizzard that occurs in a place where that's not a typical weather event. So it's an unusual weather event that can threaten people and property, and we're certainly seeing an increased impact from those types of events all around the world. And one of the best ways to define something like this is to give some examples. I think people can relate to them. Uh, so we want to begin with the Buffalo Christmas blizzard of 2022. Uh, let's talk about this storm itself. What happened with this severe weather event and how did it surprise some people? Well, this was such a dangerous storm. And in a place like Buffalo, who is uh, people who live in Buffalo and that part of New York uh, near the Great Lakes are used to dealing with extreme cold waves. They're used to dealing with lake effect snow, heavy snow amounts. What happened here was that several factors conspired together to produce a tremendous tragedy where over 60 lives were lost in a scenario where there were rapidly falling temperatures to uh, below zero in, in some cases, along with gusty winds and snow, Jeff, that was falling at a rate of three to four inches per hour and even more in some cases. And all of that was poorly timed. It was right before the Christmas holiday and people were, uh, were driving around. They were perhaps doing their last minute Christmas shopping on their last day of work before the Christmas holiday. And all those factors, you had a combination of weather related factors and non weather related factors conspiring together to produce a tragedy and a disaster. And uh, 60 plus lives lost. There are a lot of category three, four, possibly five hurricanes that don't produce that kind of a toll uh, to human life in some cases. So uh, a lot of people shrug off. They say, yeah, it's Buffalo. They get a lot of snow. But this was a truly deadly situation. What were some of the other aspects of this and impacts of this storm? Well, I think another aspect of this and here at AccuWeather, we had the most accurate forecast 
on this blizzard, and we used the best language, the best descriptions, right in the AccuWeather app and right in the AccuWeather forecast, talking about rapidly deteriorating travel conditions, rapidly falling temperatures. We were doing everything we could do to emphasize how unusual this was, because as you said, and it's a reality that we consider, uh, Buffalo is a city that's used to dealing with big snowstorms, as we talked about. But what was uh, particularly impactful about this storm, and we knew this in advance, and it's why we used those uh, urgent messaging that we did, was that this was going to go from a dangerous situation, but a manageable one, to a true life-threatening emergency in the matter of a few minutes. And you saw people that were unprepared for that, uh, that there were people who literally, tragically froze in their cars. Uh, they, were they were perhaps wearing shorts as they were just out for a quick errand or whatever the case may be, and they ended up uh, in a complete scenario where there was you couldn't see uh, five feet in front of you because the snow was falling so hard and it was getting whipped around by those gusty winds and the temperatures were falling to below zero. So it became an urgent, life-threatening situation. And by the way, there was no travel ban in effect before the storm. And I believe that was a major factor why people were caught off guard because even, uh, uh, you know, they eventually did put a travel ban in to effect, but it was only after life-threatening situations happened. And uh, those bans can be very helpful in helping to uh, communicate by the government just how serious and dangerous a situation can be and it can be another deterrent for people to be out in such life-threatening conditions. And every uh, storm is a learning experience. You know the city of Buffalo has kind of pivoted and taken some some lessons learned in that event that we've seen implemented in more recent winters as well. And I actually think that's a great point. It's in a blueprint as well for what other cities can do because they did look at uh, what happened in this horrible tragedy and uh, through the state and the county, Erie County, and the city as well as other agencies, look at how they were going to better communicate in advance. And in a, a very dangerous situation, this past winter involving, that's when the, the uh, Steelers and Buffalo yeah. Bills uh, uh, playoff game was occurring, they did enact proactive travel bans. And I think that was extremely helpful. While there were tragically some lives lost, nobody, to my knowledge, passed away in their car, freezing to death or anything of that nature. Uh, that was a lesson learned, and I think that's a blueprint of how other communities can best prepare. The more act proactive they are, the more likely lives can be saved. And if we look at another extreme winter weather event, you know, the volume of snow in one city doesn't correlate mm -hmm. to the impact in another city. We had that I-95 disaster in January of 2022. Uh, so what happened in this storm in parts of Virginia? Well, this was another one of these situations where the uh, situation quickly escalated from a dangerous scenario to a truly life-threatening emergency in the matter of minutes. And AccuWeather expert meteorologists, we were alarmed by this set up in the days before the storm. And we used wording uh, in our apps and in our products talking about that highway chaos might occur and that there would be rapidly deteriorating travel conditions. Because what happened here is there hadn't been a, a major snowstorm in the DC area for two or more years. Uh, and this was the first commute after the, uh, the New Year holiday, right? So uh, that's always gonna be a challenge anyway. But the situation that we saw was that rain was going to be rapidly changing to snow and that uh, would occur so quickly. We described it as a, it was gonna be like flicking a light switch in terms of how quickly that would occur. And as the temperatures plummeted, that rain uh, that had previously wet the surfaces started to freeze. It created a thin layer of, of ice on top of which that snow started to rapidly accumulate and the snow was falling one to three inches per hour. That's too fast for even the most experienced road crews to keep up with. And what ended up happening was I-95 uh, there were numerous accidents, including tractor trailer trucks that jackknifed. The road was shut down. Some people were stuck in their cars in a life-threatening situation for more than 30 hours. Uh, a real harrowing situation in, in that case. And yet again, no travel ban in advance. Now, we know closing I-95 is a big deal. That's not something that's taken lightly. But uh, if even the roadway had been closed for the time period that we had highlighted, a narrow time period in a narrow area, it might have averted that disaster. So again, the need to be proactive with regard to those travel bans, it can have a big impact. Absolutely, and I know this one had, uh, well, there were some senators and uh, right. representatives right. Uh, heading back to Capitol Hill with this one. Uh, so uh, certainly a lot of uh, huge uh, impacts, but a lot of eyeballs, a lot of conversation here with policy and so forth following that. And there were so many people that uh, were just in a, in a life-threatening situation that we, as a, as a country, we have to say, 
you and I were talking about this on the air after the event. We had we said we have to as a country say that stuff can't happen. The superior forecast was there from AccuWeather. It goes to then how government and other agencies react to it and how people change their plans. Absolutely. Very dangerous situation yeah. there. Uh, and again, this is Virginia. This was not uh, North Dakota in a blizzard or something like that. Uh, a lot of great information so far, John. We're going to be uh, talking a lot more with you in just a little bit. We're also going to dig into a viewer question or two. And coming up, we do have three striking facts about lightning that may spark an interest and may even shock you. But after the break, we're going to switch away from snow and ice and discuss some extreme flooding events. We've had no shortage of them in the past couple of years. We're going to ask your questions as well when Ask the Experts return. Stay with us here on the AccuWeather Network. Weathers Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish, and today we are talking extreme weather events, and we are back with AccuWeather Chief Meteorologist John Porter giving examples, also giving you a little bit of information on maybe how you can best respond when one of these extremely impactful, dangerous, potentially deadly events occurs. And uh, John, in the last segment, we talked a lot about the uh, winter weather events from Buffalo to Virginia. Nobody's really exempt unless you're in the Florida Keys. You're right. So, uh, well, uh, extreme weather is not limited to any one time of the year. We want to talk about extreme rainfall in the fall of 2023. We had flash flooding that hit New York City here in September of that year. Uh, and a coastal storm unleashed more than eight inches of rain in parts of New York City. Right in the metro, closed roads made major impacts on mass transit, and it shut down rail and subway travel. Uh, and we want to talk a little bit more uh, detail about this event. So, John, uh, how did this break down? Well, the issue with this was, once again, the rainfall rates, how quickly the rain was falling. Uh, it was The rain was falling too fast, too furious, at a rate of two to four inches of rain per hour. And one of the things that I've learned in my uh, 20 years here at AccuWeather is that rainfall rate is so much more is so much more critical to defining where the most dangerous impacts occur than the storm total rainfall, for example. And in a in a highly populated, uh, dense urban environment like New York City or Philadelphia, whenever the rain rate exceeds one and a half inches per hour, there's so much concrete, there's so many, uh, so, so much roadway, uh, buildings, other impervious surfaces, there's nowhere for that water to go. And when it runs off, it's going to result in extreme flash flooding, like we saw in this particular event, with rain totals uh, as AccuWeather had forecast before any other source of four to eight inches falling at that uh, rapid rate. And uh, there were totals, as you mentioned, over 10 inches in this particular storm. And it was interesting because it was a, a relatively narrow area that was mostly affected from Midtown Manhattan east toward uh, parts of, the, of uh, Brooklyn and Queens and over to Western Nassau County as well. So in that, in that area, the uh, impacts were significant with roads, streets that were turned into uh, tor torrents of, of uh, water in the matter of minutes. And once again, it quickly escalated from a dangerous situation to a life-threatening emergency in the matter of minutes. And how often are we seeing events like these? And should we be doing more as people or maybe as city administrators and governments to prepare? Well, I think we are seeing, there's no doubt we're seeing these extreme rain events occurring with greater frequency and impact. That is directly tied to global warming in terms of the fact that uh, a warmer atmosphere on average it promotes higher levels of moisture in the atmosphere. And when that can be wrung out, uh, in these different situations, we end up with these extensive heavy rain events. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that um, uh, there are many protocols to deal with different types of severe weather events in various communities. Uh, hurricanes, winter storms, uh, high wind events, the list goes on and on. But there's an extreme vulnerability to these flash flooding events where some of the same life safety procedures are not necessarily enacted or that some governments may not necessarily or businesses may not have a plan and they're underprepared for these types of situations and uh, that's an area i think that uh, needs to continue to be enhanced going forward and about two years earlier than that same area hurricane ida produced some devastating and really frightening flash flooding uh, so how did that storm with hurricane ida set up well, that was another interesting situation because uh, AccuWeather meteorologists had warned about that flash flooding ahead of all other known sources before the storm even made landfall. Uh, we were obviously concerned that whenever you bring a, 
uh, tropical rainstorm up into uh, the eastern part of the United States, it interacts with uh, the Appalachian Mountains and then moves up the I-95 corridor uh, and, and really merges with another storm system that was coming across from the Great Lakes. That process wrings out extra moisture. And so before the storm even made landfall, of course, it was a devastating storm across uh, portions of Louisiana where there was a storm surge and, and uh, flooding rainfall and damaging winds. But before the storm made, made landfall, we warned that there would be a risk for days to come. And it was one of the greatest, uh, it was one of the highest forecasts for rainfall that we have ever made here at AccuWeather for the New York City area, with a, saying there was going to be four to eight inches of rain widespread with an AccuWeather local storm max of a foot of rain, a very unusual heavy rain event. And we said the rain would come too fast, too furious. And there was catastrophic flash flooding. It was, in fact, the worst flash flood in New York City history. Uh, there were uh, tragedies in uh, surrounding states. Uh, many people were injured or lost their life, including a Connecticut state trooper in, um, in southwestern Connecticut, for example. Uh, and there are so many times where the water uh, rises so quickly, and people who are unprepared for uh, or have not seen that kind of rainfall before are caught off guard sometimes by how quickly the water rises. And even six inches, Jeff, of, of uh, fast-flowing water is enough to dislodge a car downstream. And so many times the, uh, the tragedies in flash flooding events are associated with people driving in areas yep. where water covers the road. Absolutely. Well, a quick uh, viewer question comes from Brittany in North Carolina. Brittany writes, what's the best advice you can share for what to do during flash flooding or a flash flood warning? Well, I think uh, the number one thing there is to know where you're at. And if you live in a low-lying area or if you live near a stream or a creek, you're going to be at extra risk for flooding impacts. And if it, being uh, proactive and out of an area like that before flooding starts is really important. The other thing I think is, uh, is key is just because you haven't seen water in a particular part of a community, even if you've lived there your entire life, doesn't mean that in the next storm, with heavy rain amounts or a high rain rate, that flooding and, in fact, a life-threatening situation could even evolve, evolve in that area. So uh, don't let your past experience be your guide in terms of assessing um, the risk. And most especially, if you're in a flash flood warning, consider avoiding travel or consider delaying that travel by even a little bit, even by an hour or two sometimes, it could save your life. John, some uh, great information. Thanks for joining us here on uh, Ask the Experts. We could do a lot of shows on extreme weather events like this. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, good to be with you as always. All right. Coming up next on WeatherWise, we've got three shockingly cool facts about lightning. Ask the Experts. We'll be right back. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. It is time now for WeatherWise and a segment we call Weather by the Numbers. Today we look at lightning and some shocking statistics. Our first number, 54,000. That's the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit that a lightning bolt can reach. For comparison, that is five times hotter than the surface of the sun. It is amazing to think that that kind of heat can be created from just a spark because that is how lightning forms in the atmosphere between clouds, the air, and the ground. Our next number, 270,000. Obviously, lightning is fast. 270,000 is the speed in miles per hour that lightning travels. That's 30,000 times faster than a bullet at that time and at that speed. There is no time to react, and that's why it's so important to get to a safe place when conditions are possible for lightning. Finally, our last number is 20 million. 20 million is the average number of lightning strikes just in the United States every year. So where is lightning most common? Typically, Florida. Florida is the state with the most lightning strikes per square mile in any given year. And there have been recent years when portions of southeast Oklahoma have actually uh, given uh, the Sunshine State a run for its money with similar statistics. Thanks so much for joining us here on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. Don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Thanks so much for being with us. Have a great one.